Hello and welcome to episode 4 of my YouTube series Increase Your Research Impact. In this episode we'll talk about how to get cited and I'll discuss the four C's of citation impact. Competence, communication, collaboration and care. I want to be really clear on this. Uh, what we're talking about today are things that are intrinsically important in academic publishing and in academic careers in general. I'm not saying you should do all of these things just to get cited. That's a very instrumental approach that I would not encourage. But all of the things I'm discussing are things you should do anyway as an academic. Um, and you might as well know that if you do them strategically, they will also increase your citations. First of all, the first C is competence. Um, your work won't generally be cited if it isn't any good. So if you've published rubbish work, then generally it won't be cited. Not completely true. Some rubbish work does get cited and some very good work doesn't get cited. But overall, um, there is a match between the quality of the work and the level of citations. Um, there is a pretty strong correlation, a correlation that we as social scientists would die for. So uh, we can all think of counterexamples, but on average, the better your work is, the more likely it will be cited. But you can actually improve the chances of your work being cited uh, through the three other C's. And the first one of these, and that's actually by far the most important one, is to communicate your research. And it makes sense in a way, but it's surprising how few academics consciously realize this. Um, your paper can only be cited if an academic knows about it. They don't know about your paper, they can't cite it. Um, I see so many academics hesitating to put their work out there, um, thinking it's a waste of time, but then expecting other academics to pick it up without being prompted. Well, maybe that happened 20 or 30 years ago, but not these days, when every day we get thousands of papers published. Um, so you need to stand out there. You need to communicate your research to the right audience. You can do that face to face, as we've always been doing at conferences. You can go out and talk to people um, and share your most recent research. Uh, but there's other ways to do it as well. Um, and one I'm talking about today is the use of social media. It's a really effective and easy way to communicate about your research. Um, and in my view, social media could have been made for academic introverts like me. And I think about 80% of the academics are introverts. Um, so I think in general, it's a very good medium for academics. Um, and just like with social media in a private context, you can use it in a supplementary way. Um, if you engage with someone on social media, you follow their work, um, you occasionally uh, retweet their work, you like their work, you ask questions about their work, and then you meet them at conferences. It's almost like you know them, even if you haven't met them before, because you've been looking at that picture of the academic and at their work repeatedly and then you meet them in real life and if they resemble their picture there's an immediate connection um, and this happened to me earlier this year when I met uh, an Australian colleague that I hadn't seen for at least 10 years because I presented at his university but hadn't seen him since we saw each other and we started chatting and it was like we were continuing a conversation that we'd been having on the various social media and we were both surprised that we hadn't actually met face to face for 10 years because we were so familiar with what was going on in each other's professional lives. So just like with using social media in a private context, it's part of a communication package. So the next one is collaboration. Collaborate with other academics. And again, you're not doing that just to get more citations. You're doing that because 
first of all, I think it makes doing research much more fun to work with other people. It usually leads to better quality research because you look for academics with complementary skills uh, to your own. And it also, I find, helps to shape the paper because you always have someone to read your paper critically. Of course, you can ask your colleagues who are not co-authors to read the paper, but a co-author always has more motivation to read your paper critically than uh, a colleague. Um, and also, if you work with others on a project, there's more of a motivation to finish the project. Because you can tell yourself, mm, yeah, actually, this paper, I'll just leave it, there's other more important things to do. But if you get emails in your inbox from your co-author saying, I've done my bit of the paper, you promised you would do your bit, it's harder to say no than when you're just working on a paper on your own. Um, so there's lots of good reasons to collaborate. Uh, but another good reason is that co-authored papers generally tend to be cited much more than single authored papers. Again, not always, there's always exceptions. But on average, co-authored papers are cited much more. There's two reasons for that, or at least two reasons. First of all, because each of the authors has their own social network, so they can spread it amongst their um, network. Um, and some of that will overlap with yours, obviously, but some of that will be unique. So if you have three authors, you might have at least twice the size of the network. If you have five authors, you might have three or four times the size of the network. If you work in particle physics and you have a thousand authors, then um, you probably have 500 times the size of the network, which makes quite a difference and shares the load in communicating about your paper. But also don't forget that your co-authors will generally cite you in other projects as well, because they're citing their own paper as well. Um, and you're not doing all of your work with the same co-authors, so these co-authors might be working in other projects. They will be likely to cite the paper you've done together if it's relevant to their new project, because they know the work and are familiar with the work. So the last one, a bit more tenuous, but I had to come up with a fourth C thought about this for a long time and I've, start, I've decided to come up with care. Um, I think this is important in general because care makes our profession a much nicer place to be, but I mean this care in two ways. First of all, care about your own reputation. In academia, just like in many other disciplines, your reputation is your most valuable asset. And nobody wants to use or cite the work of an academic they don't respect. Um, academia is a small world. You might not think this, but um, usually people, especially at conferences, they talk to each other. They know um, the people who are what we call salami slicers, who write up like eight papers on one piece of uh, research and trying to manipulate individual variables. They know the people that um, are not good colleagues because they want to get their name on papers with others without doing the work. They know people that are not what I would call good academics. Um, and personally, um, I go out of my way to avoid citing these people. Uh, there are always a dozen papers or at least half a dozen papers you can cite to make a particular point. So I'd rather cite someone who I know is a good ethical researcher. So care for your own reputation and make sure that you don't ever engage in unethical behavior. But also care for others. Um, care um, for others and help others whenever you can. Um, and I see this happening a lot at conferences where people talk to each other and they get talking about their research and they get all excited and say, yeah, I have some great resources on that, I'll have some papers, I'll send you that list. And then after the conference they come back and they don't do any of this. They get drowned in their teaching and admin um, and they forget and they think, oh, these people will probably forget about all these promises. Uh, but I don't think that's a good way um, to network, to make sure you create strong personal bonds. 
Personally, what I do at conferences, if I speak to people I promise to do something, I ask for the business card and I write down what I promise to do. I take the business cards home and then after the conference, maybe not the day after I return home, but maybe the weekend after I've returned home, I go through the business card and I just spend one or two hours doing what I promised. In some cases, and especially if you're a junior academic, in some cases it might even be as simple as sending a thank you message if you met up with a senior professor in your field and they've presented you with some feedback on your presentation. Like saying, oh, it's so nice to meet you and, and maybe try and connect with them on LinkedIn as well. So continue that, that conversation. The good thing is though that in comparison to 10 or 15 years ago, when we only had email, and even before that, when we only had faxes and letters to communicate with other academics. And now, um, collaboration and care can be facilitated through social media. And it's a very easy and non-invasive way of keeping in touch with colleagues. Do you want to know more about this? Then go to my website, housing.com and look at the white paper that I've written, the four C's of getting cited. Just Google it and you'll find it. In the next episode, we'll talk about why you should use social media in academia. I hope you'll join me.